it's like when we started like iPhones weren't a thing Facebook yeah. didn't exist like none of this stuff was around my kids were still really small um you know now they've graduated college so world of changes from a healthcare perspective you know healthcare has always in, embraced technology you know there's x-rays there's MRIs there's C scans um, all, all sorts of technology but they were the, really the last industry to embrace data um, Well, hey, RJ, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me today. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to diving into the whole world of digital therapeutics. But before we go into that topic, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and kind of what got you into doing what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. I, I started out way back when, computer science degree came up through the, the software development, the programming ranks, um, developing solutions quickly realized it's not always about technology and it's really about the people and the processes. So that drove my career through project management, program management, general management. And then in the early 2000s, working for big consulting, um, realized I could go off and do this on my own um, and do it cheaper um, yeah. and, and probably better in a lot of situations. Uh, so we started uh, Estenda uh, the company I, I still run today, uh, 20 years ago now. We just passed our Holy 20th smokes, anniversary. And thank you. Uh, it's been quite a journey when I can talk about decades. It's yeah. it's always it's always interesting. Um, but yeah, we've been focusing on digital health, software development, data analytics uh, for the last 20 years. Yeah. So you've obviously been doing this for a while, like you said, decades. Um, what's the biggest change or challenge you've seen arising from like kind of the, just the digitalization of everything, including healthcare? And what has that kind of done for, kind of, I guess, your work and what you've seen happening in the industry? Mm -hmm. I, great question. And as I reflect on this over the years, as we hit our 20th anniversary and really thinking about that, it's like when we started, like iPhones weren't a thing. Facebook yeah. didn't exist. Like none of this stuff was around. My kids were still really small. Um, you know, now they've graduated college, so world of changes from a healthcare perspective, you know, healthcare has always in, embraced technology, you know, there's x-rays, there's MRIs, there's C scans, um, all, all sorts of technology, but they were the, really the last industry to embrace data. Um, and, and 20 years ago, data was scarce. EMRs existed. Um, we were lucky early on to work with military healthcare and government organizations that had the electronic oh, yeah. medical records, but not until, you know, it was mandated did it really come on board. So early in, in the 2000s, data was scarce. And when we were driving decision making, it was how do you make decisions on limited data? Fast forward 20 years, almost everybody has electronic medical records now. It's how do we bring this together? Um, I wear an aura ring, you know, the Apple watch tracks all sorts of information. There's just so much data that is available now. So we've gone from data, data scarcity to an overwhelming amount yeah. of information. And it's now it's how do you drive information out of the noise? You know, how do you, how do you make decisions on what's important in that data, as opposed to trying to figure out that limited amount of information. Now it's too much information. So, yeah. And then we've moved, you know, digital health in general. You know, we, I would say we've been doing digital health before it was called digital health, but now it's, it's really starting to be recognized for what it's capable of. And that's where uh, this, this term digital therapeutics came about. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it is interesting for, um, I mean, maybe 10 years ago when I was at the VA as a clinician and we were doing some projects uh, around like patient engagement and stuff like the the data you know the VA just had tons and tons of patients tons and tons of instances and encounters and somewhere somebody was like logging all this data but it was like even back then it was like well we've got these servers that have like thousands of patients you know encounters and notes and all that kind of stuff but even then they were trying to figure out like how do we make sense of you know terabytes of information like needling through it and finding what's what's important and what's not important and um, and part of that is because at least it, the way I I saw it was like, 
we built these systems and it was like data was one of those things that, oh, we can gather the data. So we're just going to do it. <laughs> but there was like no rhyme or reason to like, okay, we want to code it or we want to segment it or we want to do something to make it useful down the line. It was just one of those like, we have this ability now to gather data. So we're going to gather data, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, and healthcare is still somewhat there. You know, yeah. medical records, everybody has them, but they're very much driven around collecting data for billing. Yes, exactly. Not for, not for care management, and that's slowly changing as we advance and we get a handle on how to manage all of this data. But you know, if you look at a, a patient record, a particular patient record, the way EMRs tend to work is a lot of that's going to be duplicated information. Yeah. So how, how do you bring the power of technology um, to solve those problems? Yeah. Well, let's back up. And you mentioned the term digital therapeutics. So for those of us who have, have no clear understanding what that means, uh, what is that term? What does it mean? How are you using it? <laughs> yeah, it, it is a relatively new term, um, probably six or seven years ago. Uh, there, there's a group out there called the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. It, it only started, I think, in 2017, 2018. Okay. We're really driving this idea. And a digital therapeutic is an evidence-based, clinically validated digital health application designed to treat and manage a patient directly. So you, can, you are sharing information with your care providers, but it's really designed to treat you as the individual patient. And the way I think about it is there's uh, 300,000 digital health applications by, yeah. by some count. There's tons of digital health applications out there, but they just don't have that level of clinical validation, the evidence to say that they really do work. They might work, but nobody has taken the time and the effort to do that study. And to bring it back, I think of it as, you know, you go to the pharmacy and you can buy all sorts of vitamins, minerals, supplements, they might work. There's some evidence that some of those work. And that's the, that's how I think of as, as the general digital health applications. They yeah. can, you know, can provide value. But then there are medications, drugs that have gone through extensive clinical trial, FDA validation to prove that they work and the FDA or other global regulatory bodies have reviewed that work um, to make sure it was done properly. And that's the idea around a digital therapeutic. It has that elevated status. It is evidence-based. It has gone through clinical trials. It's gone through an FDA level review um, to, to be able to say, yes, this does work. And in a lot of cases, those, the idea around a digital therapeutic is that it's prescribed by a physician and can be reimbursed by the insurance. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point. I I wonder how much of that, like the the fact that there's a lot out there, kind of like the supplement world, is probably that one, studies are expensive to do, but also like just the proliferation of them, you know, like maybe 10 years ago, the idea of like a, wear, like a Garmin watch or an Apple watch is like tracking your O2 and your, your heart rate and your sleep cycle, like that technology was thousands of dollars, you know, like, and now they're just, you can get them for a couple hundred bucks. Um, so we've gotten this we went from an area of like just getting that de kind of data was expensive and kind of out of reach of most people. And now they're basically it's consumer goods that can do this. Um, so you've got like a huge proliferation of all of these things that technically fall into the digital health world. But like you said, a lot of them are supplements. And it's interesting to see like studies that have been done that I've seen a couple like around the use of wearables, for example, it's like, okay, well, if you use wearables, we we found this correlation to like increase activity level or decreased obesity or risk of cardio disease or whatever it is. Um, but they're just looking at the broad spectrum and not like this specific device, you know, decrease the risk of falls by X percent or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and you you said it, it's correlation, not causation. Yeah. You know, there, there's all sorts of ideas and you see this a lot of in, in the public media uh, the general media media that it's like correlation it, it's not it's not saying it causes it but you know there's some association between these two things is it meaningful we don't know yeah so and i mean i guess that's the kind of the biggest differentiator then between like your standard digital health tool and digital therapeutic is just that this one has been you know the digital therapeutic has been validated. We've got evidence to support that if you use this specific device for this specific condition with this specific patient population, you know we we've got some efficacy there that we can rely on based on the evidence. Correct? 
Yes. Yeah. It, it makes a difference. And and that's the, the key differentiator. It's that it's gone through that, that the exercise and, and they do take time. It does add cost to bring the, the solution to, to market. Um, but the idea is that, you know, so you think of, of you as a consumer and you go to the Apple store, the Google play store, and you're going to buy an app. People tend to not pay a lot of money for those apps, even though they might be like a dollar. It's like, yeah. I don't want to spend a dollar on this thing, a little app. Um, so in the idea of digital therapeutics and, and prescribed therapeutics, where your doctor is saying, okay, here, go use this, uh, you can get reimbursed by the insurance company at a much higher rate. So there's definitely a, a business model and a business driver for companies yeah. out there to go the digital therapeutic route. Um, but yes, it does take you know longer and, and have more overhead associated with it. Yeah, and what I'd imagine too, there's probably a little bit more of a, um, like a patient uh, engagement or utilization of it if the doctor says, oh, you could get yourself a wearable and track your steps or your activity level versus, hey, I've got this device, you've got this issue, I want you to use this for 30 days, 60 days, whatever, we'll track it, we'll we'll use this to kind of treat and manage this this disease, and then we'll kind of see how we're do going. I imagine, you know, option B there, where the doctor's giving you this specific thing and telling you to to use it for this specific issue, is going to have a lot higher adherence than like, oh, well, you can get a wearable or something like that, right? I, I, it absolutely does. Um, your doctor, your your care provider, you know, the nurse practitioner you're seeing is a trusted resource, um, and, and there's something called uh, sentinel effect. Yeah. Uh, and it's basically the idea if somebody is observing and following your behavior, you're going to tend to track that more and be more engaged and do it more. So if you have that trusted provider, you know, saying, hey, do this, and they're going to be able to see this data, people tend to do it, do it. more often, better, be more engaged with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I didn't even really think about the whole, the the cost and the time that it takes to put one of these things in place as well. So I, I imagine it's kind of like a drug timeline wise, right? Like how many years are we talking from, okay, we've got this idea for this digital therapeutic or this future digital therapeutic to, okay, we're going to market. I mean, we're talking what, five years or more just to get through the the development, the the studies, the validation, the approvals? Yeah, it's, it, you, you mentioned the drug world and the drug world, yeah. I think it's like 20 years now to, yeah, to get something. Really long. And, and, probably a, over a billion dollars to, to go through the full cycle kind of thing. Fortunately, doing things in, in the digital world um, is easier. It, it still does take time to do that. And I've, I've heard um, in, in general from, you know, the start, the inception to, you know, on market with FDA approval of like three to seven year yeah. time frame. But there's definitely strategies you can use to, to mitigate that and be able to hit market and, and drive value faster. You know, so in the beginning and early stages, let's get a product out the door that's not necessarily classified as a digital therapeutic. Um, yeah. You're gonna market it a little differently. You're not gonna you know, make the same claims once it has gone through FDA validation, but let's get it to market, get that user feedback and, and start driving you know, revenue earlier. Yeah. Is there anything you need to do? I would assume between like, okay, this is the, con like you have to differentiate. This is what we put out. This was, let's call it 1.0, the option 1.0. We tested that in the market. And then now it's a, we've gone through the reviews. It's going to be a digital therapeutic. Like I'm assuming there's maybe some kind of features or benefits or so, there's something that's got to be done to kind of differentiate it from like this thing that you can get off the shelf at, you know, Radio Shack or something. <laughs> yeah, Are there any Shack. Radio Shacks there's, around? <laughs> there's, an old, there's an old reference for you. Yeah. Um, but I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, there, there is. And, and it really starts with the software development process. How are you okay. building this solution? You know, so when you're you know, manufacturing a drug, you know, there's a lot of history and data and process that has to be followed and collected. Same thing in, in the software world. You know, we have a very well-structured quality management process. The FDA, not to, to start getting techie, but, you know, the FDA is, is the part 820 process. And we happen to be ISO 13485 certified, which just says we have a well-documented software development process, quality management process that we follow. And, and we get audited um, regularly to make sure that we are following this process. 
So in the end, when you do go to the FDA, you have the history, the information around the, how the product was created, how it was tested, um, and the evidence to be able to say, yes, we've, we've actually done this. And with the digital therapeutic, it's gone through those clinical trials. So, you know, a, a minute ago, I referenced the idea, let's get something out and get it to market. On those early stages, it's like, okay, we haven't done those extensive clinical trials yeah. yet. So, you know, we think this works, but we're not sure. Let's do those um, early clinical trials. And we have at Estenda some PhDs on staff to help drive, you know, those clinical trials and, and get that information and analyze the data. And then as it progresses, okay, now let's do these, the full blown clinical trials. Yeah. And are you using like the initial go to market? Maybe it's a consumer device or something like that. That initial data that you're gathering from that to kind of lay the foundation for what will be a future, like let's call it a randomized double blind study or something like that. Or is it, um, is it totally separate? Like you already kind of know how you want to set up the study or what you think you're going to you actually be looking for. And then all this other data that you're getting from the consumers is kind of just secondary or answer, like helps build the case, but it's not laying the foundation. Yeah, it's, it's more building the case, understanding what works in the product, what doesn't, and helps you adjust. And um, you know, we, we follow an, an agile methodology, which really means yeah. it's just iterative. We're constantly improving on the product. In those early clinical trial studies with smaller numbers of people, it helps drive those changes Bigger, and then helps yeah. you plan out when you do get to that randomized you know, clinical controlled trial kind of thing, which is the gold standard uh, these days, so. Yeah, yeah. but I, I imagine this type of, I mean, obviously doing any kind of like rigorous uh, scientific study or clinical study involves a lot of capital and human resources. Like how are startups funding this? Is this one of those things like they're just raising capital from VCs to try to put these through? Or are they partnering with universities on grant funding to try to make sure it's um, non-biased, so to speak, like, you know, if you get a, a study like, okay, you know, Rafi's ABC company also has Rafi's digital therapeutic and Rafi paid for all of it. So, you know, like imagine there's something like you want to make sure it's academically rigorous as well, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And and the answer is all of the above. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as a startup and you're out there and you're, you're trying to, you know, drive the development of the solution, you know, yes, partnering with it, an academic medical institution, really good. Um, you know, you're just going to have a lot of value from that, um, some objectivity from that. But you can also go to pharmaceutical companies. They're very much um, engaged in the idea of, and sometimes I've heard it, the digital pill. Yeah. Uh, so how can we bring this to, to market as well? So yeah, they they are very interested in that as well. A challenge in the pharmaceutical industry is. You know, the cost of a digital health app versus um, an actual drug is, yeah. is almost a rounding error. You know, so take yeah. a drug, a new drug to market. It's like a billion dollars with, you know, several billions of dollars in potential revenue. The digital health app isn't going to cost you a billion dollars to develop and put out there. Like, you know, hopefully you'll make a billion dollars yeah. off of it. But yeah. You haven't seen that in the digital health world quite yet. So there's definitely interest in, in the farmer world. Um, but you, you have to really drive that. Um, and then VCs, yes, they're, they're interested in all sorts of opportunities along those lines. Um, unfortunately, this year, things have taken a little, little bit of a step back in, in the digital health world, but everything's cyclical. It'll, it'll yeah. come back in the, in the next year or two. I was at the, the health conference in, in Vegas a, a couple of weeks ago, and, and there is a lot of excitement about just what's possible in, with digital health and technology these days. Yeah. What's the, what's been the biggest driving factor for the pullback? Has it just been the interest rates kind of keeping capital, you know, close to close to people's chests or, or is there something else kind of driving some of the, the yeah, pullback? it's a combination of, of coming out of COVID where, you know, telehealth in, in, was a in big deal, yeah. just like went through the roof. Yeah. Um, but everybody sort of pulled back from that. So there's that. And then just general um, economic trends. Um, as, as interest rates have been driving through the roof, so everybody sort of pulled back a little bit. But it, it, I truly believe it's cyclical and it's just going to come back around. Yeah, yeah. And there's always ups and downs, right? So um, one of the one of the things that I'm thinking about now that we've been talking about what it takes, all of the the work, the effort, the time, the capital that it takes to take something to become a digital therapeutic. Like, how does this affect things like? access, equity, all of those kind of buzzwords we've been hearing about 
in in not just healthcare, but it, it definitely affects healthcare as well. Like all of this work, all of this time, all this energy adds an added cost to the device, to the tool, to the solution. At what point does it become like a cost prohibitive thing or an issue for maybe people in lower uh, lower socioeconomic status or don't have the, the same access to, to that type of care? Is that something we're concerned about or is there like a plan for that in, I guess, maybe in, in payers or, or regulatory uh, world to try to make sure that even though we're doing all of this work on the front end, it's expensive to make sure it's a valid product that everybody will benefit from it at some point. Mm -hmm. And I was at the, uh, again, the health conference a couple of weeks ago, there was a major topic of discussion, just the yeah. idea of access to care, um, equity, equity in that major topic. I think digital health and, and digital therapeutics really helps that. Um, so there are costs associated with it, but uh, a major target for digital therapeutics is, is mental health. Oh yeah, there are yeah. not enough mental health professionals in the world. Um, my wife happens to be a pediatric nurse in, in the Philadelphia area, major metropolitan area. There, there are you know pediatric psychologists, people that are trained to take care of, of kids and, and teens. But you go into the rural United States. Yeah, there are going to be less of those two hours to the nearest available. one, right? Yeah. Right. So if you can use the digital technology, digital health applications, digital therapeutics to give people access to the care and treatment that they need and they deserve, um, it, it helps bridge that gap. Um, you know, you hear a lot about just okay, who has access to smartphones, and and that is very true. That that is an an issue, um, but that's changing more and more. Cost and price of the, the smartphones that, that drive a lot of these solutions are coming down in price. And then with the idea of, of digital therapeutics, where the cost is the insurance company is paying for it, um, helps out, out that helps out that patient. Um, interestingly, here in the US, there, there is a challenge of being uh, the insurance companies reimbursing for digital therapeutics that hasn't quite caught on as much as one is, as would hope there is legislation going through through Congress now to, to try and really drive the idea of, of that reimbursement. Um, Germany has, has passed um, some extensive legislation that sort of is being upheld as the gold standard way of doing this. And when it gets through the regulatory process, it's also tied to, okay, now you're going to get reimbursement for this as well. And that's sort of a separate thing here in the US. It's like, okay, you can get through the FDA review process, yeah. Now there's a whole other process to get reimbursed you're get for paid. It. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's a, a challenge, but it, it's definitely when we talk about access and, and equity to care, um, digital health scales. Um, so someone at the conference said, "You can't birth our way out of out of the problems we have in healthcare. We can't. There's just not enough people that we can bring yeah. to bear fast enough to the pro the, to the challenge." So. Yeah. And the other the other sort of challenge in healthcare. In, in clinical studies, in, in trials, in, you know, particularly in AI, there's a problem in AI of bias. It's like the data that you train the AI. Exactly. On, yeah. You know, is, is, you know, the, the rural America is not going to be, you know, as well represented, you know, um, there. So if we can move to this digital world, particularly in those clinical trials and can pull in more people more easily. Um, and then that drives care all around. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. I remember I was talking to somebody the other day about AI and they said they they brought up that same point. It never really, I never really thought about it. Like, oh, you're using data to train these models. And if all your data is from, you know, three or four <laughs> major metropolis cities in a, in in the area or in the, in the in one country, you're missing out on a lot of generalizable results across all kinds of populations, right? Different ethnicities and cultures and, and all of that. It's It's interesting. Not something you would think of initially. <laughs> no, no, and and it's it is a lot of that research is driven, unfortunately, by white males. That is changing very quickly, but that data is Caucasian white male, and and so that when it then goes to a different population, you see where the AIs don't perform as well, and, and so now it's you know people are definitely looking at it and analyzing it and aware of it. So that is changing, changing quickly, which is good. Yeah. Um, so the, on the issue of like paying for it, obviously in the United States is a totally different ball game. Cause we've got 
third party payers that are doing that. But you would imagine at some level, like especially with this move to trying to get away from this fee for service and more towards a value based model of reimbursement that that payers would wake up to the fact that, oh, this thing, this solution costs less, it uses less manpower. And hopefully if it's been validated and we see that, you know, it's gone through the studies and we can show and demonstrate efficacy that it's a cheaper, uh, effective solution than what we've been doing, right? Yes, it, absolutely. It's, and we have to move the, the U.S. healthcare system from sick care yeah. to, to well care. <clears throat> so. Yeah, trying to trying to an ounce of prevention is is worth two pounds of cure, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Lose lose you know ten percent of your body weight, and you're going to get healthier. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't even have to be that much. Lose some weight, you will get healthier. So move, you yeah. will get healthier. You don't have to <laughs> exactly. exercise necessarily. Move, you know, walk, you know, uh, park a little further away from the store, and you know, walk the parking lot. Those things make a difference. Yeah. Cool deal. Um. Anything we've missed in regards to to digital therapeutics and the like that you want to cover? Um, yeah, we touched the the, the major points yeah. kind of thing. There's there's definitely opportunity there. Um, reimbursement is is the biggest challenge, but that yeah. that's being addressed. Um, go out and and look up the the digital therapeutic um, legislation that's going through Congress. Um, you know, ultimately, it, it's it's not about the technology though. It, it's about the people and the processes that are driving all yeah. of this. So um, heavily in, involved in, in the startup world and love to see what everybody out there is doing. So it's, it's awesome. awesome. Um, well, just leading into that then, where can people find out more about you, your work, Estenda, and we'll link to all that in the in the show notes after you give us Yeah, that. Our, our website is, is probably the easiest. Site, uh, estenda.com, E S T E N D A dot com. We're at a bunch of the, the conferences. Follow us on, on LinkedIn. That's usually where we're always posting. You know, we'll be at this conference, that conference. You know, yeah. love to hear people's stories, love to just have a conversation um, and see what's going on out there. So it's been great. Awesome. Cool deal. Well, RJ, thanks so much, man. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. This has been fabulous. All right.